I expect the metals to be in a more vertical tone, especially evident over the next month. Well, perhaps, perhaps extending past the election, but a lot of it probably before the election. So I'm thinking over the next five weeks, you could see silver do something like go to 55 bucks. There's some technical reasons for that. Let's yeah, talk about that. Yeah, you know, and, and gold, I think, go to 3,000 to 3,200. Michael Oliver, thank you so much for your graciousness and joining me on the fly here. How are you? I'm just fine. It's Andy. Good. A lot of things going on um, and a lot of stuff to talk about. Let's start first with this huge move in gold. And it looks like silver's uh, folly, a following yeah. uh, starting to catch up. And then we'll talk about um, everything else. But uh, by the way, you nailed it. Congratulations and thank you. And I, for all of our listeners and viewers, I am a client and I couldn't be more happy. So let's talk about gold and silver first. The four big categories that we look at are the monetary metals, also commodities, but they're not always linked. Uh, stock markets, bond markets, and foreign exchange. And they're about to get all very dynamic is our argument. But gold led the way. It's not a dumb market. It doesn't follow events. Everybody thinks, oh, it follows a data point. But yeah, maybe it responds in some way. But basically, it's a smarty. It, it, it knows ahead of time what the major trends are going to be. So in late March, gold woke up after you know, three years of this doldrum. Okay. Silver and the miners had been in a staircasing downside correction where gold basically went sideways. They went down. Okay. But they all woke up at the same time using our metric of annual momentum, meaning we measure the action versus a 36-month average, for example. And it's not crossing the average, it's crossing structures that we see on the momentum charts. Okay, stop that. We'll, we'll confuse anymore. But they broke out and they surged. Gold was just above 2,000, shot up to 2,450, went sideways for a bunch of months. Now it's 26 plus, 2,650. Silver, uh, Exploded, shot up to 29, just short of 30, backed off. And then in May, while gold went sideways, silver gained more, got up to 32.50 area, which is where we are today, for a third time, by the way. Uh, I expect the metals to be in a more vertical tone, especially evident over the next month. Well, perhaps, perhaps extending past the election, but a lot of it probably before the election. So I'm thinking over the next five weeks, you could see silver do something like go to 55 bucks. Now, there's some technical reasons for that. Let's you know, talk about that. Yeah. You know, and, and gold, I think, go to 3,000 to 3,200. Now, which on a percent basis is far less than silver going to 55. And I think silver is about to re-engage again in terms of its relative performance. Right now, it's still dirt cheap versus gold. And some technical reasons for us to assume that it could reignite its relative strength in a way that is, you know, sort of jaw dropping. Okay. And the miners are doing the same thing. You know, after underperforming gold between the 2020 high and 2023, they, they went down sort of in gold sideways. They've now re engaged. And GDX, which is up to 41 plus right now, it's high back in the mid 2020 rally was 45.75. Okay, so we're still about 10% short. I expect it to blow that out and go up into probably the mid 50s, which is also where I think silver is going to go up into the mid $50 range in this surge. No, I don't mean to say that's the end of the bull market. I'm just saying in this particular exhale or inhale, however you want to view it. Uh, that surge could carry that far for those two particular markets, thereby outpacing gold over the next, let's say, month or two. Uh, then we get a pause. I don't think it's the end of the bull market whatsoever. I think it's just just a possible place to pause, but it's it's way up there. I mean, if we went to fifty five dollars silver, people would be astounded, especially if you did it quickly. Um. And there's other stuff going on in the world. You know, I mean, I don't fundamentally, but also technicals and the other major categories uh, that, that could get very dramatic 
as well. Well, I want to talk about that, but first I want to give all of our listeners some um, some perspective here. I had you on in March and you made the call that GD, GDX was really, GDXJ was really where the value was and it was going to scream. And you nailed that um, relative to GDX and relative just to about everything. So we're sitting at 11 hot year highs when I checked right now on GDXJ. Question about that. You said, mentioned that gold, you expect silver to outperform gold. Do you still expect the miners in general to outperform? And do you expect GDXJ to outperform GDX? We haven't done much analysis on GDXJ recently versus GDX, for example, but uh, we know a couple of things, and these are technical observations. Anybody can see it if you do your own looking at the spread relationships. But the gold miners relative to gold are dirt cheap. Okay. Yes. They used to be at much higher relative levels to gold back 10, 20 years ago. And then in that 2015 bear trend, the spread relationship, not only did price go down, but the spread relationship of miners to gold collapsed. Now, since the 2015 low, again, off the page, cheap relative to gold. This is true also versus the S&P 500. Yeah. Okay. They've firmed up, but in a way that almost looks like they're hardly off the ground. Because if you look at the spread chart where it was you know, 10, 20 years ago, and then look at it now, and you say, you know. Yeah, they've been firming. Actually, we, we did a report in the weekend report. We showed how GDX actually, if, if three years ago, this is September three years ago. If you bought GDX, you made more money in GDX than you did in the S&P 500. People would drop, drop their jaw at that. It's true, okay? GDX has also gone up more than gold on a percentage basis, but it's still dirt, dirt cheap, historically speaking. Now, it's a tiny little category, miners, the gold and silver miners are on an asset basis. So when big asset managers look around and they perceive risk in the stock market, you know, greater risk than they're comfortable with, they want to therefore move into something that feels better. And they may not even have an intellectual argument for it. They may just say, it's doing better. You know, it feels better, even if I'm not a gold bug. And so you had guys like Druckenmiller back in February went into Newmont Mining, biggest gold miner out there, big blue chip, you know. And if you look at the price chart back then in mid-February, it was $31, $32. Now it's now 55 I think. Okay. So you know, he's done fairly well, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he beat the heck out of the market even, the stock market. And uh, it's, it's crossing the various hurdles. We, we got very bullish at 42. Uh, he actually beat us on that. But uh, so, uh, we had a major breakout in momentum when it crossed to 42. Now it's, again, 55. And... It's evidence to me that the big blue chips in particular, and, you know, it's heavily weighted within GDX, for example, Numat is, is, is the monster, okay, that big asset managers are getting antsy about, you know, the stock market. And, you know, and frankly, if you go sideways and look at the charts, they really haven't made much money in the last several months. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been steady and firm after having broken down, but it's really not going anywhere. It's spinning its wheels but looking good still. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they realize there's a lot of them are skeptical. You know, they have reasons. Maybe it's not reasons that I would have that are macro technical, but fundamental reasons. The valuations are just too high. Risk reward doesn't look good. So they're looking elsewhere. And I think they're buying T-bonds and they're definitely buying gold and gold related. And I think the miners are getting the benefit of that and will continue to. And at some point, the juniors will definitely outpaced the biggies. And they're already, you're seeing some evidence now with GDXJ versus GDX, where the real cheapies suddenly get electrified. Why? Because they're a small little sector and it doesn't take a lot of money moving from stock market over into the miners to suddenly goose that sector. And I think that's what you're beginning to see. So if we get more wobble in the stock market, and we're expecting a very serious wobble in the fourth quarter, you're going to get more money fleeing that category. And going where? Whatever looks good 
And right now, frankly, one of the better looking sectors, if you measure it objectively, is the gold miners. Yeah. Okay. So um, that that could really goose that sector and particularly the juniors. Got it. So you brought up a good point. They want to get to the other markets in just a second, but I just, I want to reaffirm this is money flowed to GDX, which is the new months of the world, if you would, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, and then money will flow. We're, we're anticipating money to flow down to the smaller players, which is pretty much the juniors that flows downward, yeah. correct? Yeah. And I, I think that because of the thinness and smallness of that market, it doesn't take a lot of hands grabbing it to, again, be the wet bar of soap situation. And I think you're starting to see that. Right now, as I said, I think GDX is going to blow out that high it made in the summer of 2020 and very soon and uh, exceed it by an amount that would drop jaws. And that's not the end of it. That's just the, the initial, I'm awake. Yeah. Oh, it's the surge. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. So let's talk about um, the other markets and let's start with the bond market. Uh, we saw the inverted yield curve no longer, correct me if I'm wrong, is no longer inverting. A lot of money piled into the short end of the curve. What's your read on the bond market? And then let's talk about the dollar. It looks like it's rolling over and it's at a really key support level right here. Yeah. Okay. First off on the T-bonds, uh, they are, you know, the 60-40 rule of portfolio allocation, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, as opposed to be balanced. Okay. Which is to some extent nonsense, but especially in 2022, you got killed on both sides of that equation. Yep. Bonds down like 35% price, even more than the stock market went down. But the momentum, long-term momentum action of T-bonds over the last year and a half or so has developed what we consider to be a base. In other words, building energy for an upside move. Now, a, a caveat, the very long-term technical trend of the T-bonds is bad. It's negative, okay, meaning higher yields ultimately. It's not a good asset to own from an investment point of view. But from a trading point of view over the next quarter or so, I think it will gather the flow of money again that's moving from the 60, 40, moving more back into T-bonds again uh, as simply a place of safety relative to what is perceived to be potentially unsafe stock market. And it's coattailing. Some of the buying that's coming in has come into gold and gold mining, for example. It's outflow from the stock market going into gold, the miners, and to T-bonds. If you go back and look at the 2000 stock market top to the 2002 bear low, or the 2007 stock market top to the 2009 low, two assets rallied during that time, gold and T-bonds. Okay. Now, this time around, though, it's a bit different in that I think the T-bond rally is going to be limited. It's going to be fun, you know, for maybe another quarter or so. But you better, don't, don't get married to it because the very long-term trend is broken. This is a major counter trend rally. And ultimately, I, you know, if that market starts to shake as well, at some point a quarter or two from now, more, even more money is going to flow into gold. Interesting. Now, I wanted to talk about the dollar, but I think bonds, let's talk about the general stock market, actually, because as money fleeing into bonds, especially the short, short term bonds, because they're stiffing out danger here in the overall general market. We stress the longer term bonds, by the way, the 30 okay, year. Got by it. the way, when we say that, we don't stress also muni bonds or high yield corporate debt, long term debt there. Those don't look good. It's strictly so look government bonds that look good for the time being. Uh, got it. But yeah, I, 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 I see that as an evidence of the pending stock market break. And we see technicals on the stock market, S&P 500, NASDAQ 100 in particular, which is the leader index, that are very dark. Meaning when you look at the price chart of NASDAQ 100 or, or the S&P, you see this upward arcing price action. You can't really find anything that says, gee, if I drop here, I'm going to break something. You know, it doesn't look like it's, there's anything real obvious to break. Quarterly momentum of the stock market looks terrible. It has a floor that it has built, where if you looked at the quarterly momentum chart of the NASDAQ 100 in particular, you'll see that three times in the last two years, 
you've dropped the NASDAQ down to its three-quarter moving average, therefore on the oscillator down to its zero line. And it's built a floor, meaning a structure. Okay. If you break that structure, watch out. The last time I saw this pattern so clear, also two years wide, use of the zero line was in 1987. I caught, the, I caught the crash in 87 in a small way. I was a futures broker. It was five years before I set up MSA. And I was plotting quarterly momentum chart, and it looked exactly the same as the NASDAQ looks right now. And what happened was you were playing around your highs in the third quarter in price, but momentum had built this structure that it had used three times over a two-year span. The problem was that three-quarter moving average gets adjusted every quarter. It's like a 200-day. 200-day gets adjusted daily. Three-quarter doesn't change. Once every quarter, you adjust it. So it's like a big gear wheel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right now, the NASDAQ 100 three-quarter average is going to vault from 17,500, which is where it held this quarter in the sell-off, jump to 18,600. And we're trading 19.9 or so right now. There's also some other levels before you even get there that indicate you're in the process of breaking. But if you ever go down to that level again, you will not hold this time. Now, does it have to crash? No, but it's highly likely to make a lot of noise if you go back down there. That's only five or so percent below the market. That's a sneeze. Whereas you could drop the market 5%, nobody would even care looking at the price charts. But momentum says you're dead. Now, at that point, suddenly the stock market would become a dynamic force, causing a lot of rethinking by asset managers, looking for, again, a better place to be. And they look around and they see T-bonds up ticket and they see gold, you know, obviously doing what it's doing. And they say, well, you know, I'm not a gold bug, but it, stuff's behaving well, you know. And three big managers I know of got into it and, you know, they're doing well, et cetera. You get the point. And so that's an asset category to watch because it could have an impact not only on money flow, but central bank panic, which they've already begun to do. They'll really panic if you break that market because that when you break the stock market, the data points will suddenly go vacuum with the market. So if something looked marginal data point wise, economic wise, it ain't going to look marginal after that. And and they'll go full throttle. So, wow! So that really fits the narrative of uh, asset managers. What's what feels right? And, yeah, feels good. And what looks to be cool to them? It's as simple as that. It's not great science. It's just this. This hurts, and I'm losing money as a portfolio manager. Therefore, I got to get into something that isn't losing money. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the dollar here, and that's actually. Really interesting because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I would think if a dollar rolling over, it would be good for stocks, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. Could this just be a flight from U.S. assets here? Yeah, yeah. If you go back and look, we ran a dollar study in the weekend report, dollar index we're talking about, which is, of course, 57% euro, I think. A, and when you combine the yen, it's about 70% of those two currencies, which constitute dollar index. Okay, forget that. Um. Uh, Dollar index, if you go back and look at its price, it made a major low in 2008. One year precisely, March 2008, before the stock market made a major low in March 2009. But if you stand back, forget the ebbs and the flows, just look at the big picture. It's risen just like the stock. So as the stock market's gone up with waves of downside, you know, the dollar's gone up with waves of downside, but still up. All during the same time, started one year before stock market turned up. But basically, they overlapped. So I don't know about that argument. If the stock market bond, if, if the dollar goes down, it, um, the dollar goes down, it's going to hurt foreign investors who are in the U.S. stock market because they own the assets and dollars, right? Okay, so right. it hurt two ways. But on the dollar, it got up to 115 in 2022 and collapsed from there down toward 100 again. And then since early 2023, the dollar index has gone to sleep in about a 5 to 6% range between, mm -hmm. let's say, 101 and 107, just mm -hmm. up, down, up, down, meaningless swings going nowhere. So this 
of the four major asset categories, major foreign exchange markets went to sleep. And we call the dollar the quiet one. The guy sitting in the corner, very quiet, but very dangerous. Okay. At 104.40 back in September, as it slipped through there, we got bearish. It's, it's not collapsed. It's oozed on down. And now we're trading just above 100. Mm -hmm. uh, you've broken a lot of stuff. Now, when you look at a price chart of the dollar index and you don't look at momentum, momentum's already broken. Okay. But you look at the price chart of the dollar, you see that there was some action back a couple of years ago around the 100 low. And so you said, well, you know, that's probably support. So they're buying it there. But if you don't hold that 100 level, even the price guys are going to start to get antsy. Yeah. Uh, but there is something even more ominous. When we run a 10-year average momentum study, the dollar, where we measure it versus its 10-year average, and plot an oscillator, it turns out that there's like a trend line going back a couple decades that we've used three times on the way up. You can't plot the same line on the, on the price chart, but you can on the momentum chart. And it says if you drop down into the 96s this year, you're going to blow that structure that goes back 30 years. Ooh. No, wait, wait, when you get into next year, three months away, the number jumps up to 98 plus. We're, we're trading 2% above a level that if you break below there next year or this year, break through actually where the 10-year average itself is, that's where the structure intersects now. You blow a trend structure that goes back several decades, you're going to get a huge decline in the dollar. Now, you, you, you know, what impact would that have? Well, I don't have to answer the question. You know, it's going to help gold, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to hurt foreign investors in the U.S. markets, all kinds of wave effects. Yeah. What's interesting, it just really plays just in the, just the current narrative, really. I mean, you got so much um, fundamental things going on <laughs> that are all negative. Uh, the market, the stock market that are, I don't want to say positive bonds, but short-term positive bonds, mm -hmm. the, the dollar in very positive gold and silver. And then your indicators are showing exactly what the narrative, I guess, and it's not the mainstream narrative, but the narrative that I've been following. It no, follows, you know, oh. The four major asset categories were likely to snap major momentum trends. Gold's already done it in March, late March. Yeah. Right, and silver as well. But price is well below here. Uh, T-bonds broke out in July, upside. Uh, they're still comfortably above the breakout levels, even though they pull back today. They, they look like they're still in the uptrend, counter uptrend, but still uptrend. Dollar broke stuff at 104 something back in September. The one that hasn't broken is the U.S. stock market. Yeah. The structure, as I just defined it for you on the NASDAQ 100, there's similar structures in various sectors of the market as well. So it's not just the NASDAQ 100. So it's, it's not just it's speaking. And when you break that, then all four have gone into a new major trend direction. Not in sync with each other, but slightly out of sync. You know, within a cluster of months, they've all clicked. clicked and right. Uh, it's going to happen. And uh, I think the dynamics that we'll see will be more violent markets. Uh -huh. People will be upset. Mm -hmm. We'll have personal pain. Especially, mm -hmm. imagine if the stock market does something bad on the downside rapidly. Let's say it does it in October. Uh, the people that are hurting by high food prices on the shelf are suddenly going to lose maybe 20% quickly or more in their retirement account. Yeah. How, how are they going to feel? What's your emotion? They're pretty happy. No, I mean, uh, this will make 2008, 2009 look, I think, anemic. I think the next decline in the stock market will be horrendous because of the nature of the bubble that preceded it. Happy times if you're on the right side. Okay. All right. Well, uh, just to point out also for our listeners, I just, my mind went to, you actually, well, I interviewed you in, it might've been February. It was right after Drunken Miller made that allocation. Yeah. In my, we talked about it. Okay. The listeners and viewers want to go back. And that trade worked out very well for him. And it showed uh, your, uh, your savviness, if you would. And uh, for anybody that bought that trade, it worked out well for them. So, uh, Michael, um, I'm, a, I'm a client. Uh, I read all of your reports. I'm a huge fan. How do people, um, if they want to do business with you and read your, your, um, your reports, how do they do that? OliverNSA.com. Go there, explore the site. We discuss our methodology. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to look at there. Um, 
And uh, I think the times you're about to enter, and I'm not trying to hype it, uh, are the most dynamic I've ever seen in my life. And I think they're just beginning to show themselves. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. And for all of our listeners and viewers, I am not paid for promoting this or at all. I'm just a very happy client. So, um, Michael, I want to thank you so much for your time, your work, and just your graciousness of uh, meeting me on the fly in uh, these uh, crazy times. Thank you, Andy. Uh, stay safe. Stay stay properly invested, okay? <laughs> I, I definitely will. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.